I'm Mark Gilbert. I'm the Exhibitions, Media and Marketing Librarian here. The State Library acknowledges this land that we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. We also pay respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people visiting living or working in the region who come from other areas of South Australia or Australia. Now, I'm sure you know that Adelaide is known as the city of churches. You might have heard that cliche, but we've also been described as the city of pubs. Today we are looking at hotels in the square mile that I like to call departed spirits. Pubs that no longer echo with the sound of bar chatter and clinking glasses, no longer emit the smell of stale beer and cigarette smoke, and are no longer run by bar staff with a raised eyebrow. A lot of the buildings we're looking at today have been demolished. A few buildings survived, but have been put to more sober uses. I'm not going to be looking at, uh, in depth at the general history of hotels or liquor licensing in South Australia. What is the oldest establishment or who came up with the butcher glass? Instead, I'll be presenting stories of what happened in the hotels, the SP illegal betting, serving drinks after hours, lurk merchants and larrikins. These stories come from newspapers of the time. So newspapers such as the Register, the Daily Journal, the News uh, and the Advertiser as well as country and interstate papers, these stories were sometimes reported far and wide. The journalists in the pre-mass media period were very descriptive and fulsome in their articles. They also had a very clear eye for the amusing or the absurd. Some of the incidents were quite serious, but others were almost petty and you do wonder um, the amount of resources, police and court resources used to prosecute some of the cases that we're going to talk about. So to get a feel for Adelaide in times gone by, here is a map of the city of North Adelaide in 1936, produced by mapmaker extraordinaire WH Edmonds. It shows parklands, tramways, hospitals, churches, sporting facilities, but most importantly, pubs. And how many there were? I've kind of lost count, to be honest. I don't want to give a definite figure. But I'm just going to give a sample as we run along King William Street from North Terrace to South Terrace. We've got the Gresham, the Southern Cross, the Imperial, the Napoleon, the Majestic, the Ambassadors, the Criterion, the Prince Alfred, which is now part of the Town Hall, the King's Head, and the Brecknock, all along King William Street. Now, <coughs> pardon me, there is a note on that map that we saw that Mr Edmonds missed one, the crown and scepter on King William Street as well. He actually missed the Queen's Head in North Adelaide and the Gillis Arms Hotel as well. But uh, I won't hold it against him because it was such a beautiful map. There are about 40 odd pubs in the uh, city and North Adelaide today. There are a lot more in days gone by. Today we're not even going to touch the sides. So let's open the door to our first pub. the Tavistock Hotel in Rundle Street. This photo is from 1902, actually established in 1857. The building in this photograph actually dates from 1884 and was in the northeast corner of Rundle Street and Tavistock Street. So where the mural is now, mural is now at that corner of Frome Street. So it was demolished in 1962 because there was a, a widening of, there was a Frome Street project that went right through. So there were a few pubs that were knocked over. Um, so you can just see how grand a building this was. 
and you saw we saw the front bar of the or sorry this is the saloon bar of the hotel back in 1952. We don't have that many photographs of interiors of hotels, have a lot more of the exteriors. I will point out the lack of beer choices there. If we go into a hotel nowadays where there's so many beer taps, just look at that, you got what you got. From the news Thursday 13th of January 1927, what have you under your coat? asked a constable of Trevelyan Harris as he emerged from the Tavistock Hotel with a bulge under his coat. A crayfish, replied Harris. There was a crayfish, as well as a bottle of beer. In the Adelaide Police Court this morning, the defendant was fined one pound for having carried away liquor from the hotel during prohibited hours. The defence explained that his client was boots at the hotel and had a bottle of beer for supper every night. To reach his quarters, he had to traverse a lane and therefore the offence was only of a technical nature. This was in 1927, so he was fined one pound for, at about 6.30 for walking across the lane with a bottle of beer after work, which I suspect he did every night. The term boots actually comes up quite regularly and it's short for boots barman. The job entailed being a general hand around the hotel, so everything from boot polishing to bar work. And uh, in my searching on Trove, it does actually seem to be quite a South Australian term during that period. The Aurora Hotel on the southeast corner of Hindmarsh Square on Pirrie Street. Uh, in May 1912, when this photo was taken, the licensee was Henry Jepp. It was first known as the Black Eagle from 1859, then had several name changes, including the Marquis of Queen Queensbury until 1894, when it was named the Aurora. It traded under that name until the 1st of December 1983, when it was demolished. But in September 1923, the concern was no drink for boarders. Nelson Fuller, licensee of the Aurora Hotel, who was fined five pounds with 15 shillings costs for having unlawfully supplied liquor on September the 11th, said that he was not aware that he could not serve a boarder with drinks. Now, although Mr. Fuller should have understood the rules, they could be very complicated. Rules for bona fide travellers would be different for the, to those for locals or boarders and even friends visiting. The plan to demolish the Aurora uh, led to one of the most controversial heritage debates in the 1980s. And of course, we're having another debate now around the Crown and Anchor, which is just around the corner from where the Aurora was and is another hotel that, like the Aurora used to be, a home to live music. Another hotel in Hindmarsh Square was the Hindmarsh Hotel, and this one was on the southwest corner of the square. And this is how the hotel looked in the 1940s, and indeed and, until the building was demolished in 1988. Before 1940, it looked like this. Always nice to see some of the old cars in front of the pub. In 1896, we find a thief that thought he was being very careful. Burglar with rubber soles. Constable Renfrey caught a burglar who was wearing India rubber, rubber sole boots as he was leaving the Hindmarsh Hotel on Piri Street at half past two o'clock this morning. The man had in his possession, when arrested, three boxes of cigarettes, each containing 120 packets, six boxes of cigars, and two bottles of spirits. This was actually reported in the Kalgoorlie Minor newspaper in 1896. <laughs> now this is the Imperial Hotel on the northeast corner of King William Street and Grenfell Street in 1900. A wonderful photo with horse trams and the Bank of Australasia building across the road, across King William Street. The Imperial existed from 1869 until the building was demolished in 1960. And I'm told my grandfather used to drink at this hotel. These photos were taken just before the hotel was demolished. In 1943, at the height of the Second World War, there was, as the advertiser reported, brawl in city street. 
Some hundreds of people watched a fight between soldiers and military and civil police which began in Grenfell Street outside the Imperial Hotel at 2.30pm yesterday and ended half an hour later in the basement of Miller Andersons. Some of you might remember Miller Andersons down in Heine Street, so a little bit away. A 24-year-old soldier was arrested by civil police and charged with fighting and resisting arrest. He suffered facial injuries. Military police took a number of soldiers into custody. The outstanding police figure in the incident was 53-year-old Sergeant Olson. He was about to catch a tra tram home after signing off duty when he noticed the crowd gathering. And he also saw two or three soldiers attempting to put another soldier in a car. Sergeant Olson tried to persuade the group to uh, go into a lane beside the Imperial, and it's still called Imperial Lane there, off Grenfell Street. Military police then arrived and fists began to fly. As friends of the four soldiers joined in, Sergeant Olson and Constable pinned the 24-year-old soldier to the footpath, and then thinking he had given up the struggle, allowed him to his feet again. The soldier attacked the constables, broke away, and raced across King William Street. Constable Menadieu tried to stop the soldier but was knocked down and Sergeant Olsen went sprawling on top of him. The Sergeant scrambled up and chased the soldier down Gilbert Place, where the pancake kitchen is now, and through to Hindley Street and caught him in Miller, Anderson and Co's basement. Sergeant Olsen had his elbow and lip cut but was not seriously hurt. The police said no civilians took part in the affray, but I'm sure they all watched it as it went down those uh, King William and all that. Now, just across King William's, uh, sorry, Grenfell Street, yeah, just across the road from the Imperial at Grenfell Street, but a lot earlier, this is the commercial inn in 1866, so a reasonably early photograph. It's on the left-hand side of the photo, and it's basically where that uh, building known as the Black Stump is now. So that quite large building. The building, this building was demolished in 1896. But in August 14th, 1848, James Kerno of the Commercial Inn was charged on the information of the police with suffering the lamp in front of his house to be unlighted between one and two o'clock in the morning on the 12th instant. He pleaded not guilty, saying he trimmed it at 12 o'clock as usual. If it went out since, it must have been the wind. He was not aware how it happened. The fact of the light being out was proved and also that the same thing had occurred several times. Defendants said it was difficult to keep the lamp lighted, the oil in Adelaide being very bad. <laughs> he also trimmed it carefully before he went to bed and whenever the police had called him up, he had cheerfully relighted it. So publicans were required to keep a lamp lit during the night before street lighting was common in Adelaide. And there's lots of stories about uh, licensees being in trouble for not keeping their lamp lit. Wouldn't that have been because of the cost of running? They, they probably didn't want to pay for the oil, but um, it might have been that the quality of oil in Adelaide wasn't so great. It was only, that's only 12 years after we were established. I'm not sure that's relevant, but it was only 12 years after we were established. <laughs> uh, moving across King William Street, we call in at the Wellington Hotel, which was on the uh, northwest corner of Curry Street and Lee Street. Uh, this is um, in, the photo was taken in 1917. It was established though in 1848, and this building um, dates from 1871. So this is just before it was demolished in 1917. So in October, uh, 1915, the advertiser reported that the hotel keeper Alexander Burkholz was prosecuted for having traded on a Sunday. Inspector Davies stated that he visited the Wellington Hotel at about 8 p.m. on Sunday and found the door facing Lee Street open. So he was just wandering around looking for trouble, I think. He went inside and saw the defendant behind the bar. In the bar were a soldier and a man who said he lived at Rose Park. You can see how detailed these things are. Uh, the, the soldier was in the act of raising a glass to his lips. The witness said to the defendant, what is this soldier drinking? And he replied that it was beer. And in reply to a question as to what the other man was drinking from Rose Park, 
whiskey and lime. <laughs> Don't you know it is wrong for you to sell drinks on Sunday? And Mr. Burkholz, the publican, said, yes, I have done wrong and you have caught me. <laughs> and he was fined five pounds with 15 shillings costs. 1915, of course, was only a few, this was only a few months before that opening hours were markedly changed in South Australia, decreased, including the closing of pubs at 6pm, leading to the famous six o'clock swill, although Sunday trading had already stopped except to bona fide travellers. You can see why I don't want to get bogged down in the licensing history of South Australia. People have written theses about them, about it. Coronation Hotel in Curry Street, photo taken in 1938. On the northwest corner of Curry Street and Rosina Street, established in 1846 as the Golden Fleece. Lots of name changes, uh, including Hotel California and Armstrong's Tavern. And finally, the College Arms, which uh, was run in conjunction with Adelaide TAFE. So yes, the building has been demolished. It's on the site of where the TAFE College is now. I really like this shot because uh, it's, it shows the Art Deco stylings of the, the, the coronation and uh, some of you might remember Amskoll ice cream and milk and so forth with the band delivering out the front. But in 1942, put and take players were fined five shillings. Two couples who were detected by a member of the police gaming squad playing the unlawful game of put and take in the lounge of the Coronation Hotel on November 20th, were each fined five shillings in the police court. It was said that when the couples were questioned, they admitted that they had been spinning a put and take top for penny stakes to pass the time away while having a few drinks. All of them had a few small coins in front of them on the table. The defendants were two RAF dental mechanics, John Cooper and Albert Plungers, Miss Marjorie Richardson, and Mrs. Isabel Plungers of Scarborough Street, Glenelg. So that was reported in the news 1942, and so you would have your street listed in the paper if you were caught basically doing anything, but including playing put and take, which is that uh, spinning dice game. So nothing too serious, but still five shillings fine. Now this is actually a 1942 photograph of a former hotel, uh, the Lady Ferguson in Curry Street, so further down towards West Terrace on the uh, southwest corner of Curry Street and North Street. Uh, the hotel uh, traded until 1921. The building is actually a deli here and the building still exists, I'm pleased to say. Um, this is an interesting story from the Daily Herald in March 1917. Shandy for beer, how publican obeyed the law. In the police court yesterday, Alfred Gibbons, the licensee of the Lady Ferguson Hotel, pleaded not guilty to a charge of having on February 23rd unlawfully supplied liquor to a person under the age of 21, Elsie Annie Maud Smith. Elsie said that on February 23rd she'd went, she had gone to the Lady Ferguson Hotel and called for a butcher of beer, and the defendant supplied the liquor. The following day she visited the hotel with policewoman Ross and Sergeant Riley. Not sure how that works. So she went into the pub, had a beer. I would assume she wanted a beer, but the next day she's come back with the police. So Mr. Rollison, for the defence of the publican, asked Elsie, can you tell Shandy from beer? Elsie, the witness, yes, I know beer. Can you tell alcoholic beer from non-intoxicating non beer? I think so. Will you let me test you? And Elsie's a real trier. Yes, I'm prepared to try. The magistrate declined to allow the test. He would not allow the defence to break the law by serving her beer in the, in the courtroom. <laughs> Sergeant Riley said that on the Saturday morning with the girl and policewoman Ross, he visited the defendant's hotel. When asked whether she had anything to drink at the hotel, Mr Gibbons said he had given her a shandy gaff. He said that he thought the girl was underage. She asked for a butcher, and he made up a shandy and gave it to the girl. The prosecutor asked, 
Do you deceive all your customers by supplying them with cheaper beer? If I consider it to their benefit, I do, the hotel keeper replied. The magistrate said he was perfectly convinced that the girl was telling the truth. He also believed that the defence was reasonable and that any reasonable man would do what the defendant said he did. The information would be dismissed. So the publican was let off for serving shandy to a 20-year-old girl. Off to Weymouth Street and the Thistle Hotel. This is uh, looking south along Bentham Street from Weymouth Street, and a group of men are outside the hotel in 1923. I sometimes think the photo was taken shortly after six o'clock closing. So yes, the uh, thistle was on the southwest corner of Weymouth and Bentham, established in 1839, traded until 1970. The building has been demolished and it's now the site of a uh, accommodation called uh, the Peppers Hotel. This is the hotel in 1929. Three years later, a customer had a change of mind as the news reported. Do you realise who we are? Asked Detective Cop. That was his real name, Detective Cop. Can you imagine? <laughs> the f Do you realise who we are? Asked Detective Cop on Saturday when Conrad Tearley said to him in plain clothes Constable Packman, I want to bet on Lord Hattan and extended a shilling. Tearley looked again and turned away, remarking, I don't think I'll have a bet today. <laughs> For having offered to bet in the Thistle Hotel, he was fined two pounds with 15 shillings costs. The police prosecutor said that the officers were talking to a bookmaker when Tearley approached with his offer. Tearley said that it was his first and last bet. I bet you that's not the case. <laughs> he had not have, had enough money to bet on the totalizator. The magistrate advised him to save up until he had enough to do when he desired to bet. And here's the hotel in uh, 1938 with the kind of art deco upgrade like the coronation we saw before. Now this is, uh, again, it's a former hotel. The photograph um, is, it was taken in 1923, but it's the former Shakespeare Hotel on the south east corner of Weymouth Street, Cannon Street, uh, so southern side of Weymouth Street, establishes the Builders Arms in 1856, changed name to the Shakespeare in 1861 and remained that until 1921. Uh, it's now tea rooms, it's uh, Gibbs tea rooms, so there's another photo we have in the collection I should have put here. Some of you might remember Glover, Glover Gibbs pies and pasties. It was those tea rooms. This 1879 building does survive and is used as backpacker accommodation. So when I said more sober uses, I think I was being a, maybe a bit over the top there. Um, Weymouth Street Fracker reports the register, uh, 23rd November 1912. These boys are what might be called the ringleaders of a gang of miscreants who congregate on Weymouth Street, said, said Mr. Seymour Smith in opening a unique case at the Adelaide Police Court on Friday against six youths, charged with having disturbed the peace in the vicinity of the Shakespeare Hotel. The prosecutor continued that on the night of November 15th, they were assembled together with a few companions outside the Lord Raglan Hotel. And I would show a photo of the Lord Raglan Hotel, but of all the pubs I was looking for, I couldn't find one in our collection. And we've got about half a million photographs. But uh, the Lord Raglan is just up the road from the Shakespeare. At about three minutes to 11, two men left the Shakespeare and walked in an easterly direction towards King William Street. And when, when near the Lord Raglan were surrounded by the defendants, one of the men was brutally assaulted and, the, and ran back to the Shakespeare, followed by the hungry mob. The defence interjected and said, the thirsty mob. Yes, thirsty mob. The licensee, Mrs. Frith, was standing in the doorway and one of the men said, for God's sake, Mrs., protect me from this mob. And she tried to. She admitted the men and the crowd, 20 strong, immediately surrounded the door. Um, she said that the, the men had gone out the back way, but that didn't have any effect and a bottle was smashed through the window of the side entrance of the pub. The defence submitted that there was no direct evidence against these clients. There was lots of back and forth in this case including for evidence from the barman at the Lord Raglan, 
who has the, the, the wonderful name of Arundale Walkington, who said that the main defendant turned down another street. And the defendants denied the charges and the cases were dismissed. So it was very much a, a battle between two pubs, I think, the locals in each one. This is the uh, Wheelwright's Arms in 1925. It actually only operated till 1921, opened in 1851. It was on the west side of uh, a little street called Roper Street between Flinders and Wakefield. Um, the building still stands, but the sign which you might be able to see says Walkerville, Walk for Walkerville Ales, that's been painted over. The fruits of transportation. Footpads in our streets, says the South Australian Register, 24th of June, 1851. Now, the fruits of transportation refers to convicts from other colonies coming to South Australia and causing trouble, because we don't have any locals that would do that. <laughs> Last night about, and I enjoy the, uh, the language in this one. This, as I mentioned, this comes from the Register, 1851. Last night, about half past 10 o'clock, Mr. Newt Nagel, the professor of German at the collegiate school, was attacked in Grenfell Street by two men. The lawless interference was so sudden and unexpected that the worthy professor fell, and one of his assailants, seizing his umbrella, inflicted with it a blow which must have broken the handle in his hand. Mr. Nicholas Foote, who happened to hear the noise of the scuffle, ran, ran to the rescue, and on him, one of the villains drew a pistol and fired, but fortunately without effect. Among the few who happened to be present was Mr. Sherwin, the landlord of the Wheelwright's Arms, who resolutely seized one of the footpads and received a violent blow on his head, just above the temple. And although he let go his hold, he did not lose his courage, but gallantly gave chase, singing out lustily for the police. In these vocal efforts, he was assisted by another citizen who saw the pistol fired and followed up the chase in Gawler Place. Fortunately, the vociferations were almost instantaneously successful and the fugitive was seen to take refuge among the empty bottles and casks of which a large assemblage is usually to be found at the back of once was called the Adelaide Market, where he was captured. The ruffin, ruffinly assistant lost his hat in the scuffle and singularly enough, part of the broken handle of Mr. Newtnagel's umbrella was found in the line of his retreat. Our John Clark received three years hard labour and transportation for life. So we actually transported our criminals to other colonies. I'll just have a quick bit of water. And now we're off to Rundle Street, although we actually know it as Rundle Mall nowadays, at least the hotels I'm talking about today. So the Bijou Hotel is the building on the right of this photograph between Twin Street and Pulteney Street, established in 1859 as the Nottinghamshire Arms and renamed the Alexandra, the Dolphin, the Savoy and demolished in, demolished in 1923. Now the building in the background, that rather grand building, not surprisingly, is called the Grand Central Hotel. Um, that's where the Hungry Jack's car park is now. Here's a better view of the Bijou in 1922. And from the Chronicle in 1911, again we get the idea that crooks must come from somewhere else rather than homegrown South Australian members of the criminal demimonde. Burglars at work. Adelaide, compared with other cities in the Commonwealth, has been remarkably free from the unwelcome attentions of members of the criminal fraternity. But unfortunately, during the last few months, cases of burglary and housebreaking have been of frequent occurrence. Despite the increased vigilance of the police, in a few instances only have the marauders been brought to book, and in no case has an offender been caught red-handed. Which serves to show that the gangs at work are dangerous and daring men. It would be hard, however, to imagine a case of greater impudence and daring than that which was brought under the notice of the police on Saturday evening when a number of bedrooms at the Bijou Hotel were ransacked by thieves. It appears that the evildoers entered the hotel at about 10 o'clock and immediately made their way upstairs, 
and after ransacking drawers and cupboards, they carried a number of portmanteaus belonging to boarders to a balcony at the rear of the premises and apparently handed them to an accomplice who placed them in a trap and drove away. Fortunately, however, there was nothing more valuable than soiled linen in the majority of the bags. <laughs> Serves them right. This is the John Barley corn in 1929, which was at 85 Brundle Street. Remember, still uh, we know it as the mall now. Um, established as the Adelaide Bazaar in 1839, became the Sir John Barley corn, and then also named the Irish Harp at different times, and ceased trading in 1973. In, 1980, in 1905, they advertised themselves as dispenser of everything wet. How good is that? Everything wet you can get there, and a vendor of coffin dodgers. Now, I'm sure many of you know what a coffin dodger is. I had to look it up, as I've never had the need of a hangover cure. Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, the Norfolk Arms Hotel on the western corner of Rundle Street and James Place in 1915. Established in 1847 and traded until 1990. Uh, you probably don't recognise the building because major renovations occurred in 1976 and after that it was a basement venue there on the corner of James Place. 11th of July 1933, the advertiser reported, offered to bet with detective. Going up to Detective Harris as he was making notes in the Norfolk Arms on Saturday afternoon, Henry Holland, labourer of Harrington Street Prospect, said, I want three shillings on Wendy Lou and two shillings on Dasher Dean. <laughs> Detective Harris was standing in the passage of the hotel and had his notebook out. After Holland had mentioned his bets, Harris told him he was a police officer. Now Holland pleaded guilty and the magistrate said, you should be careful. He was a bookmaking detective and not a bookmaking bookmaker. <laughs> In the special circumstances, I will reduce the minimum fine of two pounds to one pound and there will be 15 shillings costs. So again, uh, Henry Holland of Harrington Street Prospects, so everyone reading the paper knew he was trying to put a bet on. But also you notice that the magistrate, he must have seen so many of these cases that he's making jokes about it. This rather lovely building is the King of Hanover Hotel, dates from 1876, lovely photo by Samuel Sweet, this just taken a year or two after. Uh, at 90 Rundle Street, now Mall, this uh, hotel had several names during its history, it was established as the Boar's Head in 1846, it became the Cornish Arms for a while, and then finally the King of Hanover in 1853. Due to anti-German feeling during World War I, in 1915 it was renamed the Commonwealth Hotel. But it did cease trading the following year and was used by John Martin's department store until it was demolished in 1922. Now a short article in the Mount Barker Courier and Onkaparinga and Gamaraka Advertiser of 17th September 1915 published, there was an article, a short article about hotels with German names. So at the meeting of the licensing bench on Tuesday, applications to change the names of the following hotels were granted. The King of Hanover to the Commonwealth, the German Arms Hotel to the Handorf Hotel, and the Hamburg Hotel in Rundle Street to the Oriental Hotel. Now established as a Suffolk Inn in 1840, the Oriental had a number of other names during its life, including the Saracen's Head and the Hamburg Hotel. As, it was shown, as it's shown here, and that was its longest name, 1847 to 1915, when it had to change to the Oriental. It closed as a pub in 1966, but I'm sure you recognise the building still there on the corner of Gawler Place, advertising this, this photograph, advertising Cleopatra with Elizabeth Taylor. Now, in the Sunday Mail of the 2nd of April 1949, there was a fascinating article published about a Miss Lily Deer who was described as the city's lone barmaid. 
Forty years ago this week, Adelaide stopped registering barmaids. Only one is still on the job, Miss Lily Deer of the Oriental Hotel. No barmaids were registered after March 31st, 1909. A licensee's wife and daughters, over 21, are permitted to serve liquor in SA bars. Miss Deer, dearie to workmates and customers, has been a barmaid for 40 years, the last 29 in the Oriental Saloon Bar. Today, she said, a friend who urged me to take up the work said I'd never regret it, and I don't think I have. Why have I stuck at it so long? Well, I like the customers, and the wages are better than women get in most other jobs. I got a pound a week when I started, and that was good money in those days. I don't drink, and I let the customers do the talking. I listen. Another rule I learnt early was never to remember names or drinks. A regular customer entertaining friends doesn't always want it made obvious he's a regular. <laughs> she believes there was less drunkenness when bars were open until 11pm instead of 6pm closing. She enthusiastically supported the Liquor Trades Union Federal Secretary, who in a lot of log of claims hearing said barmaids had to be more artistic and have more personality than ordinary working women and should be, pound, should be paid 10 pounds, 10 shillings a week. So yes, it's true. From March 1909 until 1967, a woman was not allowed to serve in the public bar of a hotel in South Australia unless she was directly related to the publican. If unrelated to the publican, the woman could only continue working behind the bar if she had been employed for at least three months before the 23rd of December 1908, which is uh, Miss Deer is allowed to do. That was when the new licensing act was passed. Um, so more correctly, even though Miss Deer is described as the last barmaid, other women were working in bars and of course indeed were licensees as well. And I, sh I should have made a, uh, a statement at the start of this. There's a, there's a lot of sexist language in these newspaper articles at the time, and they just assumed that the public in, in this article would be a man, of course. And that wasn't always the case. Um, other pubs in what uh, is now Rundle Mall. The Globe, shown here in 1893, where in 1860, South Australia's first football team was established. The Adelaide Football Club, unrelated to the current mob. Uh, the Plough and Harrow on, in 1882 on the side of the Richmond Hotel. And here's a nice photo too. And the red line in 1962, four years before it was demolished. Again, great shots of cars, including that combi van driving down Rundle Street just before it gets to King William Street. It was quite close to King William Street. Um, but now we're going to go into Hindley Street and the Exchange Hotel. This is a, a relatively early photograph as well in 1868 and it's second from right. Northeast corner of Hindley and Gresham Streets, known as the Australian Arms Inn when established in 1839 and sometimes known as the Auction Mart Tavern, demolished in February 1960. Here it is in 1930. In 1927, there was an advertiser article headlined, Disturbance in Hindley Street. I think that's the only time we've heard that. <laughs> a, la a large crowd ga gathered near the uh, Exchange Hotel in Hindley Street shortly before 6 p.m. on Friday, when an inspector of police and a uniformed constable were seen to be attempting to take into custody a detective against whom it was said two charges had been laid. Other police soon arrived and they had to use force, force to push the crowd aside. The detective who was calling out in trying to release the hold of the arresting officers fell to the ground and kicked violently. When the inspector tightened his grip on the man's wrist, a section of the crowd became hostile towards the police. Soon afterwards, a patrol van arrived and took the man to the watch house. So Detective Slater was later fined three pounds with one pound cost for assault on his superior officer. And the superior officer himself, Inspector Nation, was fined one pound for assault on Slater, as reported in the advertiser. So sometimes we do hear of trouble down in Hiney Street, but we rarely hear of 
police having street fights with each other. <laughs> now, just a bit further along, oops, that was the article. A bit further along Hindley Street, still on the northern side there, but this is on the corner of uh, Bank Street and Hindley. Uh, this is the Eagle Tavern in 1897, established in 1846 and rebuilt in 1905 uh, as two storeys and ceased trading in 1978. But the 1905 um, building still exists, although it's a fast food restaurant now. So this is looking down Bank Street towards the railway station and it's really bustling there in 1937. Uh, now, some of you might remember when Australians used to have to have a licence to own a TV, although you all look too young for that. <laughs> and I'm sure you're too young to remember when we needed a radio licence. In 1942, there was a crackdown on radio licence dodges. Hotel residents had no radio licence, reports the news. People residing at city hotels were each fined one pound with 10 shillings costs in the police court today for having failed to have wireless licenses. They were Albert Zions of the Eagle Hotel, Jean Brooke of the South Australian Hotel, Dorothy Wilson and Horace Maple, all of the New Market Hotel North Terrace. Now, there's no real, uh, excuse for not having uh, enough money to pay for the radio licence because as you can see a three course lunch was only one shilling and sixpence in 1942. This is the Adelaide Hotel uh, established in 19, sorry in 1839 as a Tasmanian hotel uh, sometimes called the Prince Albert but uh, really known as the Albert, uh, Adelaide Hotel for most of its time, but it did cease trading in 1921. Miss Eliza Woodhead was the proprietor of the hotel from 1907 to 1913, and we think that uh, that's her family, her daughters and sister on the balcony there. Now the building was demolished as, uh, as late as early 2017, and is now the site of the Heine Street Music Hall near Morfitt Street. Um, the Express and Telegraph, 9th September 1909, reported on a disturbing trend. The practice of men ordering drinks from females behind the bars in Adelaide hotels and then refusing to pay has been causing annoyance to several hotel keepers. It is known as beer scaling. I'd never heard that expression before, so it must be that it doesn't happen anymore, I'm pleased to say. It is known as beer scaling and legislation to prevent it was included in the Licensing Act passed, passed last year. The first such case was when James Lucas was charged with having on the September 7th ordered liquor with which he was supplied at the Adelaide Hotel and having refused payment when it was demanded of him. Cons consequent, consequently, he was deemed a rogue and a vagabond. It sounds very medieval, but he was. And Mrs Eliza Woodhead stated that the defendant went to a hotel with a friend and after calling for a butcher and a glass of beer, he left without paying for them. Now the defendant pleaded guilty and said that as Tuesday was a warm day, he invited a friend to have a drink. At the time he thought he had sixpence, but after ordering the beer, he found he had lost it through a hole in his pocket. How very convenient. Now, Inspector Birchall put a list of convictions against the defendant, including a rogue and a vagabond, riotous behaviour and idle and disorderly. So he was sentenced to one, one month in jail. Now, this is the Castle Hotel on the northwest corner of Hindley and Morfitt in 1878. Um, in 1882, the Evening Journal wrote, a spirit coquette, now that's the name of a person, a spirit coquette, was brought up for imposing on Henry McKenhill of the Castle Inn to the extent of 29 pounds, 13 shillings and five pence. The prisoner had represented that he was station manager at Kanyaka and had over 300 pounds due to him and consequently obtained a month's board and lodging for himself and three other men at the inn. And he was in prison for three months. It's not the most exciting story in the world, I'll admit, but I just wanted to say that name, a spirit coquette. <laughs> Here's the hotel in 1966 with, a, um, I think it was an EH 
Holden station wagon driver giving a hand signal as he's turning right into Morford Street. The Buck's Head Hotel in 1941. Now the Buck's Head was established on the south west corner of North Terrace and Grey Street, down towards West Terrace, not far from where the new market uh, is. It was established as a Dolphin Inn in 1848 on a site where a hotel known as the Nelson's Head Inn had previously stood. It became the Buck's Head in 1849 and was demolished in 1965. In the 1950s, the publican Earn Fay uh, registered the first hotel smorgasbord in South Australia. What a claim to fame. It is reported also that it had one of the first hotel dance floors in South Australia. Now, one notable, notable event at the hotel was reported in the news on the 7th of December 1954. Members of the Tall Girls Club held their biggest meeting since the club was formed in July at the Buck's Head Hotel. 25 girls over five foot nine have joined the club and their aim is to get manufacturers to make clothing suitable for the girls of their height. They might have been tall women, but they still weren't allowed in the front bar at that time. Um, and the previous year, the advertiser reported on a very, very, very long taxi ride. 300 pound fare vanishes. A man who hired a taxi in Kalgoorlie on Saturday night for a return trip to Adelaide vanished in the city yesterday after telling the driver, Thomas Radich, that he was going into a bank to draw 300 pounds to pay for the 1,350 mile trip. I think the taxi driver was he maybe should have checked on this a bit better. Radich is stranded in Adelaide with only a few shillings in a damaged cab following a collision with a kangaroo. An old schoolmate, Jack Police, proprietor of the Buck's Head, whom Radich met accidentally in a city street, had offered him accommodation. So that was in September 1953. And this hotel, I, I didn't know it existed till reasonably recently. Um, lovely building. Uh, the Star and Garter, which was in Sturt Street. This photo is from 1941. First licence in 1849 on the western corner of Sturt Street and Frederick Street. In 1881, this building in the photograph was built, but it was built a bit further west than that at 194 Sturt Street. And the building was demolished in 1961. In 1936, there was a birthday toast at the hotel. The excuse that a man had had a drink after hours at the Star and Garter Hotel because it was the birthday of the licensee's husband was offered in the police court today. Nellie Maud Gillespie, licensee of the hotel, pleaded guilty to a charge of having unlawfully sold liquor at 10.10pm on January 24th. And she was fined five pounds with 15 shillings costs. Albert Fells was charged with having been found unlawfully drinking in the hotel on that evening and was fined five pounds with one pound costs. The defence said that the Fells had visited, visited Mr Gillespie and toasted him when he found out it was his birthday and no payment had been made for the drink. So the poor old publican was charged five pounds for giving away drinks in the hotel in 1936. I'm sure a lot of you recognise that view. Looking west down North Terrace from the King William Street corner, 1868, on the left hand side is the Gresham Hotel. So Old Parliament House is on the right there. So established in 1851 and due to its prominent site, the Gresham was quite the Adelaide landmark. This photo shows it in 1936, it had been rebuilt in the 1870s. A lot of the pubs at, uh, uh, in Adelaide did have a rebuild in the 1870s and 80s. I mean, usually um, up to that period, they were single storey, but then in, during the 1870s and 80s and 90s, they were re rebuilt to two storeys. Um, the hotel was demolished in 1965 and uh, it was to make way for the AMP building, which I think is now the Origin building on the corner there. So in the news, 29th December 1941, the headline ran, Boots in Prison for Early Morning Visit to Hotel. 
How a former employee of the Gresham Hotel allegedly tapped a 10-gallon keg of beer in the hotel's bottle department and later rang the manager saying that he wanted to pay for it was told in the police court today. Arthur William Eddy, 33, was sent to jail for two months on a charge of having been unlawfully on the hotel's premises on December 23rd. He admitted 18 previous convictions. The night porter named Robinson said that about 2.30 on the morning of December 23rd, he was in Gresham Street, hosing the footpath. He heard a noise from inside the hotel. When I went inside, I saw Arthur and another man bending over a 10 gallon keg. The other man was holding a flagon underneath with a funnel in it, and the keg was being tilted. The man holding the flagon jumped towards me, and I ran out to North Terrace to call the police. Later, I saw the two men running out of the back of the hotel towards Hindley Street. The manager of the, ho of the Gresham Hotel, Brian O'Brien, said that he had dismissed Eddie on the afternoon of December 20th, so three days before, and had told him not to come onto the premises again. On December 22nd, he saw the defendant on the saloon bar, in the saloon bar and he told him that he had no right to be there. But on, at about 3 a.m. on the following day, so after he's been seen by the uh, night porter, Eddie rang him and said, I've done something wrong, and he added that he wanted to pay for the beer. It was alleged by police that when questioned as to his companion and where he ran, Eddie said, I'll say he ran. I came second in the Bay Sheffield, but the other fellow beat me by a mile. I'd like to train him. And I actually looked that up, and he did run in the Bay Sheffield and came second pretty, you know, a couple of years before, before that. This is the uh, former East Adelaide Hotel. So this photo is from 1942, but the pub itself had uh, finished operating in 1921. Um, it's in Robert Street. The building has been demolished. In fact, Robert Street has been demolished. It used to run between uh, Wakefield and Angus Street, east of Pulteney. Occult powers in licensing cases. A new Shackleton achieves fame. Some merriment was occasioned in the police court yesterday when Margaret Pryor, licensee of the East Adelaide, East Adelaide Hotel, pleaded guilty to a charge of having allow, allowed men unlawfully on the licensed premises. The prosecution said that on the night of February 2nd at 11.30 o'clock, the police had reason to suspect that men were on the premises a policeman saw over the back gate that five men were in the place and they gave chase. A thorough search was made and in one of the rooms, Constable Williams saw a rope handle to a cupboard being gradually drawn inside by some unseen force. <laughs> no doubt had the constable been a follower of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he would have concluded that occult powers were at work. Being a policeman, however, and possessing common sense, he believed that there was a human force inside the cupboard. <laughs> the constable allowed the cupboard to remain unexplored for five minutes or so and then opened the door. Two men were packed in like sardines. It recalled the case of a few months ago when a man had been hidden by a licensee in an ice chest and was nearly frozen to death. He understood that the man was now known around the hotels as Shackleton. <laughs> The defendant was fined five pounds with one shilling costs and one guinea council fee. This is the Orient Hotel that, was on the, that is on the northeast corner of Pulteney Street and Wakefield Street. This is circa 1873, built on the site of the Rose of Australia Hotel in 1863. The building with various modifications does still stand and is backpacker accommodation. In August 1875, Margaret Stewart, licensed victualler was, victualler, was charged on the information of Police Constable Dyer with allowing gambling in the Orient Hotel on the 22nd instant. Constable Dyer stated that on the evening in question, he went into the bar of the Orient Hotel and bought a cigar. He was in private clothes. He heard one man at the bar say he had bet two shillings and sixpence on the result of his toss. Several persons were engaged in throwing dice for drinks. The truth of the statement was admitted by the witnesses, 
who were called for the defence, but Mr Downer, for the defendant, argued that the constable had not shown sufficient to justify a police court action. So he actually stated it was common in public houses to throw for drinks, and his worship, he thought, would see how unfair it was to Mrs Stewart to single her out for punishment, and the defence did not consider that the offence was of such a nature to demand an affliction of a penalty, but she was fined five shillings in costs, so 25 shillings in all. This is the hotel in 1938, so it does, this is basically how the Orient still looks. Um, yeah, so very petty, so people just throwing dice to see who would buy the next round, but uh, yes, uh, Constable Dyer was very officious. This is the Selburn Hotel. 44 Piri Street, which is just across from the council offices there on Piri Street. Uh, this photograph's from 1935. It was established as a Selmore Hotel and Grill Room in 1887 and changed its name to the Hotel Adelaide in 1936 and ceased trading in 1970. Um, and it's been demolished. Um, in 1916, an advertisement in the Daily Herald and this followed the introduction of six o'clock closing. And this encouraged patrons, after six o'clock, go to the Selburn Hotel in Piri Street. Billiards, nine pence per hundred, snooker, nine pence fifty up, three Alcock's tables, and most importantly, in this uh, first class temperance bar. So the hotel was selling what we would probably think of as soft drinks, cordials, that sort of thing, just to keep their business going. Now, I'm finally bringing some colour to the talk. Uh, this is the uh, Southern Cross Hotel on the right with all the bunting hanging off it. Photographed by uh, Michael Lockley, 1962, uh, during the Festival of Arts. Um, so, 62 King William Street. In 1846, it was established as the Greyhound Hotel. Became the Southern Cross in 1847 and rebuilt in 1879. So the Southern Cross Hotel ceased trading in 1974 when the licence was transferred to premises at 21 James Place. Um, it was still known as the Southern Cross but later became the James Place Hotel and some of us may know it well, when it was still operating as the Marrakesh Bar. The site we are looking at now is, has been turned, was turned into the Southern Cross Arcade and is now the shiny new Kings Lane building on King William Street. Um, in 1934, the news headlined, Had Drink in Wrong Place. This, is, this kind of, um, in a nutshell, explains how difficult the licensing laws were for operators in those days. Because he went into the lounge of the Southern Cross Hotel to have a drink after dinner, instead of staying in the dining room, Duncan Wood, insurance agent of Clare, was in the police court today for drinking on licensed premises during prohibited hours. It was explained that had Wood stayed in the dining room and had a drink, he would have been within the law, as it was legal to drink with a two-course meal until 8pm. I don't know what it means if you had three courses. Uh, two-course meal to 8pm. But um, the prosecutor said that Wood had had dinner at the hotel and gone into the lounge instead of staying in the dining room, to drink a liqueur. The case was the first of its kind to be heard in Adelaide, and Wood said to the court that he thought he was within the law. In view of this and the fact that there'd be no previous prosecutions for this type of offence, the judge reduced the minimum fine of five pounds to two pounds. So that was in uh, 17th of May, 1934. So you can see just how much effort uh, the police and courts were put to for what we would think of as trifling offences. So I started this uh, talk and I had about three hours of material because I could have mentioned the John Bull Hotel, the West Terrace Hotel, the Earl of Zetland, the Queen's Arms, the Tivoli, the Directors, the Sturt Arcade, the White Horse, the White Hart, the Theatre Royal Hotel, the Royal in Hindley Street, the Bedford in Curry Street, the York Peninsula, 
the Black Horse in Lee Street, the Sportsman's, the East End, the Alberton, the Freemasons, sorry, the Albion, I should say, the Freemasons, the Rainbow Tavern, the Windsor Castle, the Langham, the Clubhouse, the Foundry, the Phoenix, the Clarendon, the Rose, the Oakford, the Green Dragon, the Railway, the Sydney, the Centralia, the Horse and Jockey, the Beresford, the Somerset, the Dublin City, the Astor, which was in Gawla Place, not the current one, uh, the Golden Fleece, the London Inn, the Angus Hotel, the Prince of Wales and the Rising Sun. But I'm just going to have to wait till next time. <laughs> but the stories I've told today and many more can be found on the State Library's Flickr page. Just go via our home page. The three albums I think you'd be particularly interested in are Departed Spirits, The Lost Pubs of Adelaide, 13 to the Dozen, The Pubs of North Adelaide, and Pushing the Boat Out, The Pubs of Port Adelaide. I'm particularly indebted to the book Hotels and Publicans in South Australia, 1836 to March 1993 by Bob Hode, and to the many nameless journalists whose articles can be found via Trove. Now, our next story from the stacks is on um, June 18th and is entitled Inking Up the Art of Tattooing and is presented by our old friend, the recently retired engagement librarian, Carolyn Spooner, who some of you may have heard speak before, who will be looking at the intriguing word of ta world of tattooing, the history, symbolism and evolution of the timeless art form showcased through items held within the State Library's collections. And Carolyn's going to be joined by local practitioner Amy C. Duncan, whose work you can see here, to explore the wor world of contemporary artistic tattooing. Thank you all for coming, and I think I'll be off for a drink. Thank you.